There we go. I see we're just before 4 p.m. So, Alistair, if it's okay with you, I'm going to hand over to you. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Mia. Yeah. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much. Yeah, well, th thank you so much again, everybody, for, for joining us. Um, last Zoom talk of the week. And we're focusing, of course, on our current uh, online auction. Um, and I suppose today we've just, what, four or five specialists are just uh, selecting a, a few works that have caught their eyes. Um, and we're just going to go through them. Uh, I think Ian will be first, uh, and then Annie, uh, and then Arisha and Valhallam, and then I, I, I'll speak at the end. Um, but yeah, I suppose there's nothing really else to say. Ian, would, would you like to start with the Simon Stone? Yeah, I'm ready to roll, Al. Um, yeah, so thanks for the, um, yeah, the introduction. Th this is one of my favorite parts of the talks, the specialist picks, because um, you, you develop relationships with the paintings that come in. They almost become like friends and for different reasons, perhaps it's the subject or perhaps it's the, um, it's the, uh, the virtuosity of the medium or in the case of Simon Stone, um, the multi, his, multi, his, very com, his competency in a multiplicity of visual languages. Um, and it, it, this, is, this is clearly demonstrated in lot 193 on the screen. Um, he started off in the 1970s, um, taught by Stanley Pinker at UCT, and he was then working in um, a language of neo-expressionism and moving between that language and also photorealism. Um, and then moving also into a strange, um, beautiful, um, symbolic language and you'll see the interplay of all of these um, languages operating in this um, in this lot, lot 193 you can see how the the stylized and simplified horses uh, the nude flowers etc transposed against very naturalistic and beautiful renderings of photographs of um, copies and landscapes um, even in the left hand um, work here i can see an actual study of commemoration uh, church in Grahamstown, where we used to go on Sunday nights as part of our religious instruction. So um, it's, it's, it's inspiring to me to see these works because um, to see an artist playing with three completely different languages and uniting them. And I think that's where the, the, the power and the excitement comes in his work for me. Um, it's the background areas of the, the abstraction. Um, the symbolic um, simplified forms in this example the horse and then the the very beautiful naturalistic um, paintings of the little um, vignettes or cartouches in in the works um, and uh, some very very beautiful um, studies the camera too i can't stop looking at the camera it looks like it's been viewed from a number of perspectives it's, it's got so much interest for me anyway this lot it's it's a it's a wonderful lot three really big paintings, um, each one 127 centimeters by 102, and the three for 150 to 200,000, I think is a fantastic value for money. And, and uh, additionally, in his work, uh, another sort of hallmark of his work is the fact that there are these strange languages and dialogues that go on in each of the pictures. You look for, you look for the pattern, you look to see perhaps in the, what, what, what exactly, what, what is each panel about? And uh, you can see commonalities, but it's not, it's not cut and dried. It's not overly easy to resolve. And I think that's part of the challenge and part of the interest for me in works like these. And um, yeah, so really lovely works. So moving on to lot 153, a gouache work by Simon Stern, um, earlier work from 1980. Um, very, very beautiful work, um, sort of a composition that celebrates the ascending form of, um, of these natural and also man-made forms. Uh, the dam wall transposed against this watery expanse and the mark making that happens in his work. Um, he's a fantastic artist. He can draw so beautifully and you see it in the water. You look at those reflections. You look at the sides of the cliff up against the dam wall. There's a richness. There's a uh, a tapestry of, of, of meaning and texture. And, and that, that for me makes him such an interesting artist and an artist who um, is, shows his virtuosity across all media. So um, starting with this work, a gouache work, a 20 to 30,000 
I see that uh, the bidding can start at 18,000. It's a picture that interests me and interests me because uh, I think immediately of Clement Senec and this beautiful example, I'm comparing it to Shangweni Dam that's held in the South African National Gallery collection, um, also um, celebrates the ascending form within the composition. Another artist, which is uh, a now really something completely different, is the following one, and it's um, Christo and Jean Claude. And this this work also reminded me in the, in the voluminous wrapping or um, how the how the um, rocks in the foreground are festooned with with pattern and color. Reminded me of the rising forms of um, Christo and Jean Claude's work, particularly the rap the rap Reichstag of 1995, which was conceived in the early 1970s, and he worked it right through to when it was done in 1995. So on that disparate, uh, I conclude my part in the talk. Yeah, about. I, I have to say, Ian, just to, to butt in, uh, if you can go back to that, that, that gouache, I think that is an absolutely fantastic work. I, I, I agree with you absolutely. Um, you I mean, I love that? the comparison with the Senec. Mm. Yeah, that's an echo. that is such a beauty, isn't it, Al? I mean, it's, it's, yeah. there's, a, there's a lovely article written by Walter Battis in our art on, on um, Senec and his ascending forms. And it's really beautifully written and it, it totally makes sense. And it, it makes you sort of reappraise or see uh, Senec through the eyes of another artist, how Battis um, experienced them. I mean, I just, I, I also love pictures that find, you know, beauty in sort of industrial sort of brutal elements, you know, whether they're big bridges or dam walls. You know, I think that's quite, um, that's quite an artistic feat sometimes. And of course, Pierniev did it so amazingly well with, with his uh, renditions of, of, of high, high felt uh, mines. Um, and, and I think Simon Stone's done a brilliant job here. It also reminds me a bit of Edith King uh, watercolors, but I think this is a fantastic work. Yeah, terrific. And it, it grabbed me immediately, this one, Al, because it's just, I, I love, uh, my first ex exposure to this artist was in 1991 when we traveled up. I was at Technicon Natal in Durban and we traveled up to go and, and meet um, some of the galleries, the Goodman Gallery, the Everett Reed, some of the others. And then the, um, I think the Everett Reed had, um, the, the offices weren't where they are now, but they were, um, in this beautiful complex and and the walls were uh, backing the parking lot were all um, covered with Simon Stone mosaics which were absolutely evocative exquisite um, and full of mystery and uh, beauty they, they would they grabbed me that was the first my first experience of Simon Stone cool well, thanks so much Ian um, any I think any can you perhaps share your screen Ian, will you just unshare yours so Annie can jump on? Ah, uh, sorry, sorry. No problem. And Annie, you must please unmute yourself so we can hear you. Okay, done. Yeah. Are we seeing your screen, Annie? I think we are. No, no, this is Senny's Senny screen. Senny's. Let me just, sorry. How do I stop this? Okay. Okay, there we go. Um. <laughs> okay, Annie, your, your screen's uh, up. So, I'm sh sh screen sharing, um, is that yep. right? Yep, okay. there we go. We can see we can see I your slides. Need, I need to go back to the beginning. Hang on a second. There's something I have to do there. I have to go. Oh, hang on. I want to. Yeah, I think if you just scroll up on the left and you'll get to okay. your first slides. There we go. So now I can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you perfectly. Okay. So um, when I was looking through the sale, 
I always select things that I kind of have an identity with in some way or another. Usually if I know the artist or I know of the subject or something. So my eyes were caught by a work by Peter Clark, um, which there's a picture of Peter Clark, which is this one, lot 145. And it's a lino cut, um, but it's of um, a yacht and the beach. And I know um, this beach, it's very close to where I live. I live in Simon's Town, those who don't know that. And we have a lot of beautiful beaches around here and they all have these big granite rocks. I think Peter Clark was either down here, this is uh, Boulder's Beach, very popular for looking at the penguins, but you can see the kind of rock formations that are right down at the sea. I think that might even be the one, that one there. I, I, if I'd had time, I'd have gone looking for the exact spot. But anyway, you get the idea. So um, that work, you know, I, I just love the simplicity of it and the sort of graphic qualities and the glimpse of the yacht going through between the, the rocks. It just appealed to me. Um, Peter Clark's one of my favorite artists. He was actually born in Simon's Town. 1929 and he worked at the naval dockyards um, for some time and in the evenings he was he, he used to paint and ultimately in 1956 he decided to become a full-time artist and he went he was he, he made that decision when he was in Teslasdal which is a little village in the Overberg and and that village um, appears, scenes of Tesla's style appear quite frequently in his works. Um, so then he went to Michaelis in 1959. And after that, he went to the Rakes Academy in uh, Amsterdam. And in 1976, he went to Norway to the Atelier Nord. I got to know um, Peter Clark because he lived in what we call the, the deep south down here in an area called Ocean View which is quite close to Simon's Town, it's about 20 minutes away but uh, characteristically no view of the ocean it's called Ocean View but there's no, no sign of the ocean and I was always very impressed that he must have been terribly devastated when the family had to move this is the Group Areas Act 1967 and a lot of these people were moved out of Simon's Town, I believe, and located there. But he never expressed any bitterness, and I always admired him for that. Um, I got to know him because he used to come into Cape Town and go to exhibitions and galleries. And I used to sometimes give him a lift. He never, I don't think he owned a car or drove a car ever, so he was always grateful for a lift and I was always very happy to uh, to give him one. He was very softly spoken, beautifully dressed, very polite uh, and had the most fantastic handwriting which is something that struck me. I always notice things like that. Um, and he went to live in Ocean View and he taught um, underprivileged children gave them art lessons for about 20 years. He was the most fantastic man. Um, he not only did, you know, liner cuts, he did wonderful paintings. He did, uh, he did, he wrote, he was a writer and he was a poet. So he had a very broad spectrum of talents. Um, and several of his pictures are of, of young men on the beach, um, this is a, another picture he did, we sold it last year. This is of the Froggy Pond rocks. I, I just picked out these because they show these great big granite rocks um, that, that are down here. This one, um, we sold that one, the boat, in uh, last year for 220,000. I just picked out a few, which seem to sort of be relevant to um, the one that we're selling today. 
And these are just scenes. This is very much the sort of uh, Simon's Town Bay with the boats and everything. His friends, they used to seek out uh, remote beaches where they wouldn't be harassed because of their skin color. And uh, he used to go to Sandy Bay. And Sandy Bay came up last year. Um, and it was a record, as far as I know, still exists 1.2 million for that picture. He uh, had plenty of awards, local and international awards. And um, I'm very glad that he finally got the recognition that he deserved. I'm, I put this one in because there's a book that's been written about him. It's called Listening to Distant Thunder, and it's a fantastic book, lots of illustrations and really worth reading if you're interested in him. And the cover of the book has a painting, which is obviously um, as a result of this drawing. And this drawing is actually on your July sale, isn't it, coming up um, at the end of the month? Yes, it is, Annie. So yeah. keep a look out for that. Um, and then, in 2014, he had an exhibition in London and he had an exhibition following that in Paris. He was very excited to go. I spoke to him about it and he was absolutely thrilled, had a wonderful time. And he came back and died peacefully at home, 2014. He was 84, he was at home sitting in a chair and that was, you know, goodbye, Peter. No fuss, no, as far as I know, no illness. I, I love this picture of him. You can see he's got great humour and he was a very special person and I really miss him, as I'm sure we all do. So I always keep a look out for his works and I'm really pleased that they're doing so well and that he did live to see some really good uh, results in the auction rooms. I think that uh, meant a lot to him. So my other pick, am I all right for time? Am I running over time? Or? No, go ahead, Annie. Okay. Um, so I then had another look to see if there was anything else that caught my eye. <laughs> and uh, of course, Gregoire Bunzar knows, needs no introduction, but there's a picture of Komiki that he did in 1928. Komiki looks like this now. This is not a travel programme, but I just thought I'd show you what Komiki looks like now. And it actually is a most beautiful spot, but of course his picture, um, it portrays this rather wintry sky and the sand dunes and the windblown trees and a few little houses in amongst the sand dunes. And he would have been 19 years old when he painted this. So it's a really early work, 1928. Um, just a little bit of background to Gregoire. I mean, he crops up all the time at auction and, uh, you know, we're always very pleased to have his works. He, he, he painted a lot of, uh, of scenes of Cape Town, of course, because he lived here. He was born in Newlands in 1909. And his father was a political cartoonist, D.C. Bunzaya, who had friends in the art community. Uh, Peter Venning, very well-known name, Peter Venning, Nita Spillhouse, uh, Moses Kotler. Um, and funny enough, his father didn't seem to encourage him to take up art as a career. But he was given, I believe, his first paint box by Moses Kotler in 1922, and then Nita Spilhas gave him an easel in 1926. So they must have seen some potential talent there and uh, encouraged him. So in 1923, when he was only 14, he had two paintings exhibited at Ashby's Galleries in Cape Town. And that was the beginning of his career. And he had hundreds of exhibitions throughout his life. He lived to about 84 or so. Um, in 1934, he set up a studio in Cape Town and he had successful exhibitions in Cape Town. 
and in Pretoria and, and sufficient to go to London where he studied at Heatherley's School of Art and he was also a fellow student with uh, Terence McCaw and Frieda Locke. And of course he went to um, Europe like they all do and he was well, under the influences of Cezanne, Van Gogh, Utrillo, Brock, Christopher Wood, you can see um, throughout his career these various artists' influences on his work. Um, there's a picture of Gregoire hard at work on in the felt. Doesn't look very comfortable, but I'm not sure anyway. These are pictures of um, of comicky which he did in the 1920s, round about the same time as the one that we have. We sold that one in 2010. There's another one. I just put these in because I thought, well, it shows what comicy was like then. There's the lighthouse. That's still there. Uh, another one. It's a charming little spot, Komiki, but of course it's very popular now with um, surfers and fishermen, and so there's a lot of traffic. And it's not quite the place it was. Anyway, he, he went, I put these in because these are pictures he did when he was in Europe. I think this is Cornwall. He must have spent some time down there. These are all little Cornish streets. This is in the 1930s, wheat fields, very English sort of scenery. Um, this also is a bit Everard group looking, didn't you think, Al? This one, it reminded me uh, uh, of... Uh, absolutely, Annie. It's, uh, yeah. it, it's so similar to, to Everard pictures. And Isn't fact, it? Just, I, I mean, if, if I didn't know it was a Gregoire, I would have thought yeah. it was... It was a, no, you're absolutely right. And I mean, as... As fate would have it, I've actually got some images at the end. Um, oh, really? Look, okay, yeah, well, this will be interesting look, to look, Looking to at similar comparison. works sort of with, with wheat fields and haystacks. But um, yes. Annie, I'm always surprised that, I mean, I, I really love Gregoire's works from the 20s. You know, these ones yes. you've just been showing, which, I yes, he's too. a very young and relatively untrained artist, but some of those works are, I think, his most interesting. Um, I agree. Yet, I, yet I they agree. Don't, well, they don't seem to be... There are not uh, many of them around. Look at this one. I think this is great. I've never seen you, this before. I was looking around, you know, to try and find something a bit different. Because if you I'm, go one, one slide forward, um, uh, no, uh, uh, no, next one in Cornwall. No, next, yes, that one. So this one, uh, you might not know, know yet, but the, that, that Cornwall street scene is coming up in our July auction. Um, oh, really? Which is quite interesting. Okay. So seeing it in the flesh, I saw it this morning uh, when, when I was in the office. It's it's a fantastic, unusual work. And but I think we've had it before. This one. Yes, that one. We sold it about ten or eleven years yes. ago. Um, and I, it's now I, I ran out of time um, to do all the captions because I knew I recognised it. I remembered it because it annoyed me. I couldn't find which little street it was. You know, having been yeah. to Cornwall. But anyway. So there aren't a great deal of these around, these 1930s ones. This is when he went to Spain. I found these on the Khan sale. We sold these two. They're not very good images, but they were fantastic works and they did very well. I, you know, we did a little talk on the Khan sale a couple of weeks ago. Um, so these are from the 30s and this one I thought was nice. I don't know where that is, but it's probably Spain or somewhere. Um, oh, that's beautiful. Also, isn't it? 1936, that one. Um, anyway, I just thought, you know, it's, it's nice to see something a bit different because he did so many pictures of the Cape and, uh, the, you know, the, the people of the Cape. I mean, I've got a whole lot of list of things here. Where did I get to? He went to, he went to Europe and then he came back to South Africa in 1937. Um, he was elected chairman of the new group. And he was a founder member, Terence McCall, Frieda Locke again. They obviously, you know, hung out together for quite a lot in London and here. Lippy Lipschitz was another member. Um, and they provided a stage for many of the younger artists who returned to South Africa after studying in Europe. And they wanted to create a, a greater general awareness of art, both in the towns and in the rural areas. They held exhibitions all over the country. 
uh, so that people could see their art. And it was quite different from uh, the kind of work that had been produced um, previously in South Africa. Uh, Gregoire was a full-time artist and he lived in Cape Town. I, he retired uh, finally to Omras, but uh, he walked around the Cape and he's there hundreds of pictures of all areas of the Cape, but he didn't, uh, he, he sort of walked the, the length and breadth of place. He did some very nice pictures of Simon's Town, funny enough, which I also sort of zoomed in on, on previous occasions. Um, but he, he saw the interest in doing sort of backyards and shacks and dead oak trees and you know, things that were perhaps a bit less beautiful in, to the eye of the beholder, but of great interest to him. And I think these works, it's, it's like a, a slice of history because so much of what he painted, it just isn't there anymore. I mean, if you go up to the Burkhart or District 6, you know, all those scenes that he did, they, they're not there anymore. They've knocked them all down. So um, I think we have a, a lot to be thankful for to, to, um, to, to Gregoire for, for the work that he did in recording all this. He had, I won't bother to read all these exhibitions I think, he had. Uh, I read recently, Annie, that dis despite him really uh, sort of visualizing Cape Town f f for so many art lovers, uh, you mentioned he, he, he grew up in Newlands. I think he only saw the sea as a very young teenager. Um, you know, this is essentially around the First World War in, in Cape Town, and I gather Newlands and, you know, Newlands was essentially almost a, an outpost, um, you know, compared yeah. to uh, sort of the Cape Town Harbour, but I think he only uh, saw the sea as a young teenager, which just seems pretty crazy. Yes, it, it, quite, he, exactly. Well, I think he, he was more interested in the sort of townsfolk and the street scenes and all that, wasn't he? I mean, I, I don't associate him with pictures of the sea. There's a picture of him. He, he did a lot of self-portraits, as you can see. I mean, there are loads of them. But I thought this was quite interesting because there he is holding up his own self-portrait. Um, and he died in 2005. He had a... He had a big exhibition in, um, in, in 1993, 1994. He took a hundred of his own pictures. They weren't selling them. They just took them around South Africa. I think they were with Onrus and they went up to Pretoria and to Stellenbosch to show all the different things that he'd done. Paintings, woodcuts, liner cuts, you know, watercolors, all sorts. And, um, he traveled around with that exhibition for about a year, but he then retired to Onras and um, as I say, he died in April 2005. So um, I hope you like that picture of, of Comicky. <laughs> I see no, there is a bit on it actually. I look today um, and I see somebody has been, so I'm glad that it, 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 uh, it has got some interest. I think it's a lovely work. Yeah. Great. Right. Thanks so much, Annie. Yeah, thank um, you very much for listening to me. And I'll yeah, pass thank you. It's always amazing listening to you. I, I, I never realized that you knew Peter Clark. So, I mean, I suppose, oh, bearing in mind where yeah. you live, it, it seems only natural, but that's amazing. People. I'm yeah. going to stop sharing my screen. Great. Otherwise. Thanks, Annie. And then, Arisha, will you share yours? Yep. Let me just get on it. Thanks. Um, Oh, just while um, Arisha is sharing it, that picture of Spain looks like the Stanley Spencer, that's the Tatham Art Gallery. There seems to be a, I don't know, there seems to be a similarity between those two pictures. It just... Yeah, I must say that rang, Spanish picture rang. is absolutely Spanish. incredible. Yeah. It is. And it's such a rotten photograph, but it was a fabulous picture. I loved it. Uh, is my screen showing? Yes, yeah, thanks, Arisha. We can Altman. see the Walter Altmans. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. Yeah. Okay, so I, I don't have as great stories as, as Annie does, um, but one of my favorite artists is, is Walter Altman. Um, and I mean, he, 
his work I studied in high school and then when I got to varsity he was my lecturer in second year which obviously I was hugely excited for um, and yeah I mean I think a, a good way to to describe Walter Altman is is a gentle giant he is um, very tall and but just the sweetest and kindest man ever so I mean he's I, I really do admire him and his work um, so on, on the auction, we have these three um, works. They Chenet Clay um, prints of, of child skulls, um, which relate a lot to anthropology and, um, and fossils. Uh, but before I get into, you know, sort of his, his what's known as his cradle era, um, I'll just give you a bit of background into Walter Altman. Um, he was born in 1960, and he um, he attended the University of Natal, where he studied his BA in Fine Art. Um, and I'm pretty sure most of you would recognize his artwork for his for his sculpture. Um, and he does these beautiful aluminium wire sculptures, which is just it's it's mind blowing to to see how he does these works and how he actually manipulates these wires into such amazing technical and complicated forms with just beautiful, beautiful line. Um, and line in his work is, is very uh, prominent um, and he, he mainly works in sculpture and drawing. So um, that's an example of his sculpture and here's an example of his drawings. These were actually, these came during a, um, a sweep in Peter Maritzburg, I think it was. Um, and these two drawings in particular were done during, I think it was in 1980, while he was still in his third year um, at the University of Natal. And again, you can just see his, his fascination and his um, liking to sort of wire and mesh in, in the chairs and the fence. And just, again, just his, his technique and line. You can just see how, how detailed these drawings are and how he really just um, puts these very, very fine lines to build up this texture on the paper, which, which is just, it's, it's incredible to see. And it's, it's just his technique is just, it's, it's amazing. And it just shows the amount of patience um, it takes just to create these beautiful drawings. And with his lines, he, he draws a lot on um, weaving. So this is also another drawing of, of um, um, a, a weaving, like, you know, just to show that, um, that technique and you can just see how in his drawings he just gets that three-dimensionality through the, the, the use of line and sh shading. Um, and then this is, I don't know if you guys have been to the, the Javit, but if you, if you have been, well you must go, they are these really, really large scale um, sculptures from aluminium wire. Um, this is the only photo I could really find, which is me standing in front of them, which just gives you an idea of the scale of these works. They are just, they are huge. And um, it's, it's quite overwhelming when you stand in front of it to imagine that, you know, Walter has actually used his hands and tools to really weave together these pieces of wire into such large, um, sculpture and what's even more just fascinating and, and amusing of it is just how clean and neat it is you know I mean every piece of wire and every line is just so is placed just so perfectly and weaved together just so gently um, and it's it really is just it's mesmerizing to just to just look at his works um, going back to so this 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 is um, lending on to his his cradle what we'd call his, his sort of cradle series. Um, he looks at, so he, he, you know, looks at the, the relationship between art and science quite a lot and looking at the child skulls, especially, um, you know, that of, of Raymond Dart, who is a anthropologist in the early 1920s when they started discovering some of the child skulls in, especially in the cradle of humankind. Um, and you know, South Africa actually is it's it's got one of the largest collections of fossils and skulls and um a very large base of study and research in anthropology and um philanthropology. And you know, he's he's quite drawn to this, and you can see sort of he he did for over a period of about five years, he kind of linked his work a lot very quite closely to anthropology. Um, and in this work, you can you can see the the child skull and the the infant figure, and he does this 
once again, this, this entire work is, is weaved out of aluminum wire. Um, and just take a closer look at it, you can just see how, I mean, the, the patience and technique in order to get these, this, this aluminum wire just manipulated into these little circular forms. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it's just incredible to see his use of line and his, it's just, I mean, I, I can't emphasize it enough how <laughs> technically amazing and beautiful this work is. Um, it's quite, it's quite a large scale work um, made completely of aluminium and it's, it's sort of like a wall hanging piece. Uh, this is coming up in our, in our July live sale. Um, and his use of um, the circles is, you know, he's got these like sort of circular forms that, that make up around the child, which firstly relate to lace. Um, so, sort of lace has a very fragile quality to it. And it's, it's, once again, that, that fragile line also relating sort of to this cradle to create this cradle for the, for the, for the form. Um, and I, I love Arisha, sorry to, to, to butt in. I, I love how in a work like this in particular, he uses shadow as part of the work, you know, because yeah. of course this is meant to be installed on a wall and um, you know, the, the detail and intricacy, intricacy that, that, that you've spoken about is almost doubled or tripled uh, by the, the amazing sort of shadow work uh, behind uh, sort of on the actual wall, which, which must be part of the overall concept. Um, but it, it does make these works sort of extra special. Yeah, definitely. And it's just, it's sort of just this, this, I mean, he, he always makes quite um, evident that he, he's very interested in line and, you know, just in that shadow, Shadow, the lines sort of just continue. So from the work on the shadow against the wall, it's just sort of this repetition that, that he creates. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really beautiful work. And um, yeah, just, I mean, the, the amount of detail and just shows the amount of patience needed. And it's also quite relatable. I mean, if you, if you like within anthropology and especially looking at fossils, when you excavate a fossil, I mean, it takes a lot of patience, a lot of, you know, detail to sit and chisel through that rock. And he sort of, in a way, does a similar process in, in really making these works and manipulating this why in a very gentle, delicate manner. Um, yeah, and so then coming back to, to these three works, um, so then he now, you know, sort of explores the, the use of line in printmaking. So these are, are called Chenakale prints. It's, it's it, in a way a type of lithograph. And how it's done is he takes a polymer plate and he basically engraves on this polymer plate, which is then run through a press um, with a, a very fine, almost tissue paper on top of it so that it's, the, the tissue paper is able to pick up the very, very fine detailed lines. Um, and then that tissue paper is then also, it's got a, a normal piece of paper behind it. So if you, I don't think you can really see it on this image, but you can slightly see that there's a bit of a change in color in the paper. So in this first square, it's the tissue paper, and then that's obviously adhered to um, a larger, you know, more substantial piece of paper. Um, but the use of the tissue paper is really to pick up those very, very fine lines in the work. Um, which once again, just to show you some details, he, he's got that same technique and that same, you know, line in those, in those forms that really make up these, these quite beautiful works, which again, you can kind of see that relation to like that, that very lace-like quality, that the, the wire, the, you know, he's sort of got all these repeating um, themes throughout his work. Um, oh, that's just a, bit of an awkward photo of me um, holding the works, but mainly just to show you that they are really beautifully framed. Um, they floated in these white boxed frames. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, I mean, this is just my pick of the auction. It's just one of my favorite, favorite. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great work. Yeah. I agree, Arisha. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Arisha. Sure. That's brilliant. Uh, right. Hallam, uh, are you here? Do you want to share okay. your screen quickly? Uh, yes, very briefly, I want to mention a couple of uh, William Kentridge prints. I'm going to start with this one, lot 130. Uh, and I'm interested in the date, 2007. 
We had just received the commission uh, to direct the Nose Opera at the Metropolitan Opera House in um, New York. And to get the, uh, his ideas going, uh, what he'd do is he would rummage through his vast collection of uh, art postcards that he obviously bought uh, as he visited uh, museums throughout the world. And uh, that is how he uh, started on, uh, on, uh, on these prints. But uh, the, the main reason why I have uh, chosen this is because it takes me back to two wonderful exhibitions in Cape Town uh, that we saw at the end of last year. The one on the right uh, is uh, the cover of the catalog of the, uh, the sculpture of William Kentridge sculpture at the Nobel Foundation and the one on the left, uh, the, the retrospective exhibition that, were, uh, that was mounted at Zeitz Mocha. And uh, those of you who went to the exhibition, I'm sure would remember the second last room, the, the, the so-called reading room. Uh, and uh, in there hung four magnificent still lights. Um, they are absolutely gigantic works. Uh, they are um, very special and his most recent work. Uh, and I think the idea comes from one of his favorite artists, uh, Edward Manet, as you can see on the left here. It's also uh, the design of a tapestry woven by Marguerite Stevenson of the artist. And on the right, I just put one example of his many, many, um, uh, 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 Manet, uh, Manet's many, many uh, still lives. So, uh, I think it is really, if you want to, to get a, a, a bit of the magic uh, of Kentridge, uh, go for that still life. Uh, very attractive estimates. I think if you go to the primary market, you can easily pay double for that. It's also very beautifully uh, framed. Uh, next, these three uh, prints uh, from, uh, they are lots uh, 127, 28, and 29, and they are part of what is known as um, a video work called Sleeping on Glass. Now, uh, it was very experimental work, and uh, it is, uh, these three are part of a set of six, uh, very experimental video. Uh, because uh, these images were supposed to be projected on two mirrors facing each other. And as the viewer walks up closer to one of the screens, uh, the image would fade and almost disappear. And uh, when the viewer steps back, the image would appear again. So uh, fascinating work. Now, Kentridge also describes this as a type of palimpsest, you know, and when you look carefully, you can see that it's printing uh, on top of uh, uh, on top of uh, written pages, and then letterpress uh, the staying at home that you see at the bottom, safe for tropics and uh, panic picnic. Uh, that is uh, uh, creates sort of like a layered effect. So it's a very interesting technique that you used here, and I'm also interested in 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 the meaning, especially of the two on the left, uh, because this was a time uh, these were produced at a time when a lot of South Africans left the country, left South Africa. For, for different shores, um, but, um, and, uh, and it's still true uh, of him today, he decided to stay in South Africa, in Johannesburg in uh, particular. So staying at home, I think, as, uh, as lovely uh, um, um, uh, is applicable uh, yeah, for, 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 for himself, for his own life. I'm showing you this because uh, this is the cover of an, uh, the first print exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in 2010. Uh, and you will see Track and Trace, William Kentridge, prints from their permanent collection. Uh, the, this is uh, the cover of the dust jacket, and when you fold it out, it is an original print. But the main reason why I'm showing you this is because the Museum of Modern Art doesn't have these prints. So I want, I want to challenge you to buy them and try and beat the Museum of Modern Art before they snap it up from under your nose. Um, the last one I want to talk about uh, is this work. Um, it is called Stage, Set and Serpent. It's lot uh, 388. Uh, and it is part of a series of 12 works uh, collectively called Thinking Aloud. Um, and uh, again, here he was, uh, as the title uh, indicate, uh, indicates, he was thinking aloud about uh, another, his first opera, The Magic Flute of 2005. 
Um, and um, in thinking aloud about it, uh, he um, uh, discussed uh, his thoughts with uh, uh, Angela Breitbach. And uh, those discussions were recorded in this particular book. Um, and uh, for me, what is interesting is uh, the manner in which he describes this particular uh, 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 series, because he says it's something in between. It is between these rough diagrams and sketches that he made while he was in conversation with Angela, and on the other end of uh, the scale, the more detailed works that, uh, that he creates when he does his stop frame animation. Uh, uh, so, so for me, uh, a couple of uh, great uh, Kentridge uh, posters, uh, I mean, uh, uh, prints. That's all, that's all for me. Thanks, Alistair. Great. Thanks so much, Phil Alam. Um, if you, I'll, you can sort of stop sharing your screen, I'll quickly share mine. Okay, great. Thanks, Phil Hallam. Um, yeah, I'll just skim through some of some of the uh, the works that caught my eye. Um, I do love going through the online sales. Uh, of course, we catalog a, a good number of them and know them very well in the Johannesburg office, but there are lots that come through our Cape Town office that I wouldn't ordinarily see. And it's always uh, so exciting for me to try and understand them. Um, and the first one is by this man here uh, that, that, that caught caught my eye. Uh, this is, of course, Beely, Beezy Bailey. Um, and the work it, that we have in the sale uh, is actually a collaboration uh, with this man over here. Um, I suppose music fans might not know who it is. Uh, this is Dave Matthews from the Dave Matthews Band, um, an enormously popular band uh, in America. I think as far as number one titles go, I think it's only the Beatles and Jay-Z uh, that are above um, Dave Matthews and his band, an enormously popular band. And I suppose few people know that, that he was born in South Africa, uh, although Leffing was relatively young. He went to St. Stithian's College in Johannesburg, um, though he liked it very much. Uh, and then I think went, went, went to Los Angeles as, as a late teenager. But he and BZ Bailey, um, have known each other for I think about three decades now and they collaborated on this particular work which I'll, I'll show you about uh, I'll show you in a moment. Um, BZ Bailey who's on the left in this image over here uh, has collaborated with a number of musicians in particular you'll see him here with David Bowie. Um, they collaborated I, I think in the mid 90s uh, he also collaborated with Brian Eno uh, of, of Roxy Music. Um, we have a number of BZ Baileys on the sale, uh, the New Moon and the uh, Cats in the Night, which is, uh, which is what I'm showing you here. Um, but the one that really caught my attention was this. Uh, this is the collaborative effort between Dave Matthews and BZ Bailey, and it's called Sugar Star Liberty. Um, and quite frankly, I, I really had no idea what to make of this work, um, and I knew absolutely nothing about it. So I, I did sort of delve in a little bit to try and understand it for myself. You'll see the Statue of Liberty over there, the obvious reference to New York City. Uh, but there is a, I suppose, almost like a, a an early digital quality uh, in a work like this, this strange looming gray head in the top right corner, very much like a sort of five-year-old would draw a sun. Uh, in the top of a, a composition. And you see these sort of screen prints in the background, these uh, sort of shadowy heads and figures, which are in fact, uh, BZ Bailey and, uh, and Dave Matthews sort of mucking around in a car, I think. Um, what's also amazing uh, 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 about this, this work is that it was printed by this man. This is Alexander Henrique, uh, who is arguably one of the greatest uh, printers working uh, today, he uh, works in Brooklyn. Um, to give you an idea of the kind of people he's, he's worked with uh, in New York from the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, uh, they include the likes of Jasper Johns, Andy Warhol, Willem de Kooning, Robert Rauschenberg, Roy uh, Lichtenstein, Robert Indiana, uh, and now uh, also uh, BZ Bailey and, and Dave Matthews. But the two of them uh, worked with this master printer, master printer Henrique, uh, and I think it was 2012. They put together enough work, um, and Dave Matthews used a, a, an unreleased song as a, as a soundtrack to this, frankly, rather bizarre video. A, a, and this was used as the main motif um, in a collaborative effort. Uh, they worked on 
large, large canvases. They worked with photographs uh, and they, I suppose, um, turned those into big screen prints um, uh, with Alexander Henrique. And you'll see Dave Matthews here working on the left, um, you know, very much in the, in the mode of a, of a Jackson Pollock. Um, but they produced a remarkable group of, of, of prints, uh, three of which I'm showing you here. You'll see the fat suit on the left and on the right, this, this sort of photographic work with uh, Beasy Bailey's head sort of obscured on the left. Um, and you'll also see our work here uh, on show at the Robert Miller Gallery in, uh, in New York City in 2013. Dave Matthews attended the opening, as did uh, Beasy Bailey. Um, then the majority of the show went to Everard Reed in Cape Town. Um, uh, where B.Z. Bailey uh, opened it. Dave Matthews was on tour, just selling millions of records at the time. But uh, I think a very, very interesting work. Um, you know, one, uh, yeah, I certainly enjoyed looking into a little bit. Um, the other work that caught my eye was this, and I don't think you could be any further apart from a, a B.Z. Bailey, uh, Dave Matthews rock star collaboration. Uh, it's a work by a painter called Aubrey Fielding, who, who frankly, uh, is barely known, uh, even in, uh, in the South African art world. I, I think we have three works uh, by Aubrey uh, Fielding on the sale. Um, I think prior to this sale, we might have handled one. Uh, so very rare that his works come to market. Uh, but I, I love this work. It's called The, the, the Haystacks um, from 1938. It's got a beautiful period frame too, which uh, I would see as quite important. Um, and it's starting, uh, the, the bidding is starting at, at 5,000 Rand. But again, I try to look a little into uh, Aubrey Fielding. Um, he was born in Johannesburg, uh, 1906, I think, 1903 perhaps. Uh, he went to Kez. He didn't last long. He, he left uh, in his early teens. Um, he writes that everybody agreed that he was completely wasting his time at Kez. So, so he left and he started working for the African Theatre Company and he was uh, employed to paint large scale stage sets. Um, you know, I suppose very much a precursor to William Kentridge uh, in, in, in Houghton. Um, he didn't last too long uh, on that front and, and he went to England. He worked for some time at the Old Vic, uh, came back to South Africa again, returned to England, sort of and a bit of an itinerant uh, uh, lifestyle, but continued to paint throughout. Um, he joined the war effort and, and during the Second World War he was made a major. Uh, he traveled really across the world and back multiple times during the war. He was part of the uh, camouflage unit uh, lecturing and designing various camouflage elements um, uh, for the British mil military. Um, and, but he comes back to South Africa and marries for the first time. Uh, and then returns to England uh, in the mid 1930s, uh, which is, I think, when he would have painted this work. Um, it is of haystacks, uh, and you know, there's a an international pre precedent for for major haystack pictures. Uh, I suppose the 19th century, starting with someone like um, Jean Francois Millet, uh, this work from from the mid 1870s. Uh, of course, noon workers at rest by Van Gogh, uh, this is from the late 1880s, Gauguin painting haystacks also around that time, 1889 in Arles. And then I suppose the big daddy of haystack painters, um, Claude Monet, uh, this work, I think appeared at Sotheby's uh, in the May of last year, made a cool 110 million US dollars. Uh, so uh, a long way off our, our Aubrey Fielding painting, but, um, there are a few things that, that caught my eye in, uh, specifically. I'm showing you an uh, image of the back, and, and this is a work on board, um, sort of like panel. Uh, you'll see there that you'll see the title, and also you see England, approximately 1938, and also Hertfordshire. Uh, and that made me delve in a little bit deeper. First, the 1938 um, is the exact time that the new group is formed uh, in South Africa. Uh, Annie mentioned Gregoire coming back from Cornwall and coming back from Spain uh, to form the new group in 1937-1938. There he is over there, uh, along with Terence McCaw and Lippi Lipschitz, um, amongst others. Uh, but that interested me. Also, the fact that it was painted in Hertfordshire, uh, because, and again, like Annie alluded to earlier, uh, Hertfordshire was really the... Um, 
the headquarters of the women of Bonifoy, and more specifically Bertha Everard uh, and her two daughters, uh, Ruth and Rosamond. Um, Bertha took her daughters to England uh, in the 1920s, really, to educate them. Um, and they settled in Hertfordshire, in, I think about 1923, 1924. And they painted in the countryside around there and produced, I think, a remarkable and a remarkably similar uh, group of works. Um, this is the Hay Cover by Bertha Everard, a work that we sold probably about three or four years ago. Uh, this is her daughter, Ruth Everard, again, painting haystacks in the mid-1920s in Hertfordshire. Uh, but looking uh, further into the South African future, other artists that have painted uh, haystacks, ends and Duplessis, and this is not a, 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 a great image, but I, I would argue an absolutely fantastic painting. Uh, by, by one of my favorite artists, Terence McCall in the mid 1940s painting haystacks. He was of course a, an official war artist at the time in 1945. 1952, the hay cart by Alexis Preller, a work uh, th that we sold a number of years ago now. Um, haystacks by Cecil Scottness, uh, Helmut Stark, who's done this fantastic uh, trippy series of haystacks. Um, uh, a series uh, that we've handled before, and I think we've got a, 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 another good number of them coming up in our September sale. And Kim Berman, who, who did a fantastic series on haystacks uh, on the high felt, I think in about 2012, 2013. So uh, I suppose I would argue that Aubrey Fielding fits into quite an interesting um, sort of lineage of, um, of South African artists painting haystacks, which in many ways is, is, is a European uh, subject matter as opposed to an out and out South African one. Um, to finish with Aubrey Fielding, uh, he came uh, back to South Africa again in, in the mid 1950s and he uh, joined the Adler Fielding Gallery, uh, which, which was an enormously important gallery from the, from the late 1950s. And I think one of the first shows that he was involved in uh, was the major Irma Stern uh, exhibition in 1960, 1961 at the Adler Fielding Galleries in Johannesburg in the purpose-built um, new gallery space by Donald Turgle. So a hugely important moment in, uh, in South African art. I have to end this, uh, the Aubrey Fielding uh, element with one of his obituaries in the Sunday Times in 1981. And I have to say it's rather bizarre, but I will read a, a, a few lines. Um, and on the weekend, Major Fielding's wife, Elizabeth Clara, and you'll see her on the right with a shawl over her knees, a meteorologist and UFO expert, will take his ashes to scatter them on Flying Saucer Hill on the heights of Kathkin Peak in the Drakensberg. This was his request shortly before he died last Friday, two weeks before his 78th birthday. So uh, those of you who do visit Kathkin Peak in the Drakensberg uh, anytime soon, um, think of Aubrey Fielding and, and his ashes and, and, the, and the UFOs above you. Um, we're running out of time, uh, so I'll probably just mention one or two more very quickly. I love this work. It's by Maud Sumner. Fantastic Spanish landscape, one of our great, great watercolorists. Uh, Annie showed that Gregoire painting of, of Spain in 1936. This is Maud Sumner in Spain in 1936. Uh, and I, I love those crossovers um, in, in the South African history of art. I don't think we know exactly where this is, um, but it links very closely, and this is just a detail. Uh, look at those sort of goats or sheep or something on the hillside, uh, a wonderful, combination of, of, of very fine linear ink work uh, with these wonderful patches of color. And I think if you look very closely at these elements and blow them up, uh, they are entirely abstract. They make very, very little sense. But of course, together, they make this wonderful sort of uh, pulsating overall effect of, of a clifftop view over presumably a Spanish town. And uh, another very famous Spanish town is this one. This is, of course, Toledo, uh, made famous by El Greco and his wonderful painting, The View of Toledo, uh, which is in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, uh, painted uh, in the very late uh, 16th century. Um, Sumner was an enormous fan of, of, of El Greco. And this work I'm showing on the left, this View of Toledo, uh, happens to be coming up in our major uh, sale at the end of the month, the 27th, 28th of July, uh, uh, starting at 120,000 Rand, uh, an amazing, an amazing painting, uh, this, and Hazel, uh, Cuthbertson, our uh, sort of lead cataloger, she did some amazing research uh, on this particular work, uh, sort of using Google Earth and Google Images to pinpoint the exact uh, spot um, where Maud Sumner 
would have positioned herself and painted this work plain air. And, and again, I, I love a work like this because it situates an important artist at a particular moment, at a particular time. And you imagine her in, I think, early 1936, setting herself up, thinking about El Greco, engaging with uh, one of her favorite 16th century masters uh, and, and painting what he would have seen um, centuries prior. Uh, this was painted just before uh, the Spanish Civil War and there was, of course, enormous damage to the uh, to Toledo during, during that Civil War. So uh, this also has a wonderful topographical uh, importance because um, it certainly uh, doesn't exist as you see it. We've uh, already gone uh, to five o'clock, so I, I, I won't speak about any any other any of the other highlights I had. Uh, perhaps I'll save some of them uh, to Monday. Um, we will have a, another Zoom session on Monday afternoon at four o'clock, uh, and we'll be focusing again on some of the highlights. Uh, more specifically, we'll be looking at works uh, that uh, don't have any bidding on them yet. Uh, the sale closes uh, on Monday evening at eight o'clock. Uh, so on Monday, we'll be uh, looking at the works that haven't yet had any concrete interest. Uh, we'll try and convince you um, to maybe put a bid in or at least give you an insight uh, into why some of these works are, are so very special. Um, but I think I'll stop there. As usual, um, we're very happy to take any questions, um, if anybody has any. Um, and we've got a good number of specialists on the line. So if anybody has any questions, just raise your hand or, 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 or maybe ask Mia or ask any one of us. We're happy to answer any specific questions you have. Yes, Alistair, I think if there's anyone that wants to ask a question, they must just unmute themselves and we'd be happy to answer. Yeah, anything. just go ahead. But like you rightfully said, we will have another talk on Monday, which will obviously continue um, on this one and we're really looking forward to that but I also will just take a moment to say thank you very much to all our specialists for joining us today and of course everyone who joined to listen to the talk but I think there's some fantastic works on on this sale a wide variety and a little bit of everything for everyone so we encourage everyone to please have a look at the online sale if you are interested it is still open like Alistair said until Monday at 8 p.m. I don't necessarily see any questions coming through. Um, I see Susie's on okay. oh, I mean, Susie, yeah. I'll say something because I, I, I know I shouldn't, but I, I just want to say thank you because I know I work with all of you and um, we work with these extraordinary artworks, but today uh, it was just such a treat to learn a whole lot of new different things. Of, and like Al said, Annie, I didn't know you knew Peter and um, your description, Ian, of, of the Simon Stones. I mean, it was just... And um, Wilhelm, you entertained us with those images of, of uh, William and Arisha. I just absolutely loved it. So thank you very much, even from inside the team. It was a fantastic treat.